Looks like I'm live now. Just be waiting here. Greetings, everyone. Looking forward to people checking in, saying hey. Ready for after hours with Lisa. Um, I saw that oh, Sue is checked in from Paul's bow. Yay, Pam from Southeast Missouri. Oh, you used to be in Aurora. Nice. Evelyn says, hey, Amelia. Hey, how you doing, girl? Oh, Pam, my friend from American Sewing Guild. I haven't been to any meetings lately. I've been kind of busy. Ah, oh, Kim from Arkansas. Pam, yes, I'm live. Oh, I know. <laughs> it's been a crazy day. I took a class today oh, on, on how to use this live software. So it's kind of exciting. Hopefully going to make things a little easier, smoother transitions. Got to like that. Hey, Christine, saw you checking in. Marilyn, Starlina, Jesse. Hey, from Virginia. Did you get all those videos watched? <laughs> Carol from Mississippi. Natalie from Mississippi. Excellent. Hey, Libby. She's checking in from uh, New Orleans area. Excellent. Excellent. I'm buffering. I know it happens, but... um. You know, uh, did I change my camera view? It looks different. Um, I was playing around with settings because I was uh, learning to use this software. So maybe it's it could be a little different. I'm not sure. <laughs> oh, yes, I changed the room around. Oh, <laughs> that was exciting. I got to take the stickies off. So I didn't change the room. I changed the view. So now when I go and I point to, to things, I'm not having to remember to point this direction. Ha! <laughs> That was like so exciting. That that was my aha moment with this class I took. I was like, oh my gosh, I could actually change it so that this is, I can point. <laughs> I, I know, small things. <laughs> um, okay, so the buffering, it just means that the quality for the live is, um, needs to get downgraded. We, we have like over um, 200 people interested in this and already people are signing in. So we're on, I'm going as fast as I can from my side. <laughs> I've turned off all of our Wi-Fi, and hopefully it will um, it will even itself out once everybody joins and 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 gets their things going. Uh, <laughs> Leanne says my sewing room's backwards. <laughs> no, it's not backwards. It's just um, I I figured out something in the software today, so I get to mirror my image, and um, now I can point. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Silly, silly, silly. Um, it just makes things easier for me. And we all know everything I do is um, uh, is trying to make my life easier. Luckily, if the video is fading in and out, you can either downgrade the video or uh, watch the replay later. So it, it should buffer in, but there's not much I can do about it because I'm an Elbert. I've turned, I've done everything I can. Everything at our house is... Uh, is uh, uh, turned off, told my husband can't watch Netflix, can't watch Amazon. Uh, so I see lots of people uh, is uh, are checking in. Hey, Sue, see that you're you're checking in with me. And Kathy from New Jersey, Mississippi. So we have all these people logging in, and there's Daisy barking in the background. <laughs> Happy Monday to you, Sharon. Excellent. Glad you could join us here. Um, Oh, crazy day. My um, We had a family get together this weekend. So my daughter's visiting and they, my, she and my husband uh, uh, usually watch a lot of movies. So they're going to be heading around the side. They're not allowed to make any funny face at me through the window, but they're going to go watch a movie on DVD, which hopefully should help with this internet connection. But we shall see. We shall see. Oh, Judy's checking in from Texas. Uh, Jesse, yes, I'm very lucky to get um, internet signal, cell service uh, out in middle of nowhere, uh, Colorado. <laughs> but uh, we wind has been kicking up a big time, big time today in the afternoon. Our just wind's going crazy and they have had a wildfire going on in um south of us knock on wood it stays south and they get it under control uh, they're two wise guys walking by oh they got dessert <laughs> so story here <laughs> uh 
I'm going to, many of you know, those of you checking in from Australia, I will be in Australia in November, which means we miss Thanksgiving here. And since my daughter's visiting, I made a Thanksgiving turkey. <laughs> so we had turkey dinner, like full stuffing and potatoes. And uh, we, so they had Thanksgiving dinner leftovers because we had full dinner yesterday and we had leftovers. So uh, it was just kind of fun memories going on. Uh, no, Judy, no snow. It was actually very nice today in the 70s. Nice and warm. Amelia's picking up her multi-needle tomorrow. Woohoo! Excellent, excellent. Um, so exciting, so exciting. Uh, you know, I just... Oh, I lost my train of thought. But I just look at the timer and I'm five minutes in. And the five minute mark means I get to say, hey, Lisa, checking in. And uh, we're doing our Facebook Live today on the Embrilliant software. And today we're going to be talking about fonts. Now, the fonts we're talking about a few weeks ago, I did the video on Alpha Tricks. And Alpha Tricks lets you map keyboard fonts so that you can type with them with your keyboard. Um, Key, um, BX fonts are usually uh, da, 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 stitch based, so they're it's a complete. That's not what we're doing today. Today we're not we're that's not that's Alpha Tricks. That's taking something that's already been digitized. So today we're going to talk about bringing in true type fonts into Stitch Artist and doing something fun with them. Yes, and when I mean fun, there's there's digit there's all sorts of ways you can they can be digitized so in 45 minutes we're not going to cover all of them but we'll cover um, a few different fun things that are easy and all of these can be done in so that I'm going to talk about today in stitch artist level one which means they can be done in all levels so I'm going to switch on over to the software and we'll see what what happens here? And Leanne, I'm hoping that lamb roast is ready. We're gonna see if we can get over to Melbourne because Lee, my friend Leanne, she makes the most fabulous lamb roast I've ever had, and it wouldn't be the same trip without lamb roast. So, gotta get my schedule all organized. Okay, so I'm gonna switch on over to the software and get my mouse. Where's my mouse? Did I lose my mouse? There we go. Here we are. See, I got a little circle here. <laughs> I learned something new. And we're, this is the software. So we're at the Yarn Brilliance program. And I have three different styles of fonts or three different styles of digitizing that were done in true type fonts. So let's, let's talk about that a little bit. So I'm in create mode right now. Okay, so you can see I'm in, I'm in level three. I have welcome, which is done in a cross stitch style, the word two, which is a sketch style, and number three, which is applique, and it's done with a zigzag font on it, a uh, zigzag style on it. So the first one I want to talk about is the cross stitch. So let me, first of all, I'm going to switch back over into Stitch Artist Level 1, just so that you can, there's less buttons to be confused with. And for those of you that are having um, video streaming issues, hopefully that will solve uh, that problem. So the cross stitch fill, that is this last cross hatch type button here at the top. That's your stitch type. Now to bring in a true type font, that is with our TT button. And it says when you put your mouse cursor on any of these buttons, it says add true type font, add an image, whatever it is that you want to do it. So I'm going to click on a new design page just so that we have our empty screen here. And I'm going to click on this TT, True Type Font button. This brings up a dialog box. And it depends if you're running Windows, it may look a little bit different than the Mac version. But this lists all the True Type fonts that are on your computer. Okay? So this is like you go from to Defont. You know the website, Defont.com? and they have true type fonts there, you can download and install those and they'll all be listed here. Now, when you have it in the, on the Mac, you can make this window a little bit larger. Windows has its same adjustment type thing. It just has a little bit different shape of your dialog box. But it, this shows you the name of the font in the style of the font. And down here it says your text. So if I select this, my your text here, because that's where I'm going to type it in. And I type in the word that I want. So if I type in welcome, W-E-L-C-O-M-E. -E. 
that is basically going to, sh that shows you what the font itself looks like in that true type font. There's no stitches. It's just the, sh the characters that show up when you type in capital W, small E-L-C-O-M-E. Okay. So this is what it would look like in your Microsoft Word program or your, any sort of, uh, graphics program or text document or something like that. So I type in my text that I want to show up on my screen and I click OK. Now, the first thing you should notice is that they come in with just outlines. And that is because a true type font isn't, even though it's thin and skinny, it's drawn so that it can be flood filled with ink. So every time you bring in a true type font, it's n even if you saw when it looked like hand pen handwriting, so really skinny, it's always going to come in like this because on the computer, when you're using it in a word processing program, it shows up, it has to be flood filled with ink. And it's, if you wanted to say do this as a simple running stitch, you just can't. If I click on run stitch right now, so assigned all this to run stitch and it would basically outline all the letters. Those are my objects and it assigns a run stitch to all those letters. The only way that you could get a single run, so basically an outline of these, is to manually go through with your draw with points tool and basically reshape, retype, redraw this whole thing. Just like in the video on the Embrilliant Stitch Artist playlist, on how to digitize handwriting. Same type of thing. You'd use this as a guide and you would just click to draw your individual lines. That's because a true type font, even though it looks like it's skinny, it's not, it has to be flood filled with ink. It's just really skinny to see. So if you want to create an outline of, an, of a font, simple. You bring it in, click on outline and you're good to go. I'm going to go back to artwork just so that we don't have stitches. Remember that if you want to resize this, they're all selected. That's a whole design. And each individual one of these letters is an object. And this E is an object of the outer shape of the E with a hole in it. Okay, so if you look at your screen here, see there's an E in the hole. So that's the whole shape. The L, the C, all the letters are individual objects. So if you want to say resize this entire shape, you have to select them all. And you can drag a corner or as I like to resize center out, I hold down my shift key and I can resize these and place them where I want into my hoop. If I want to say move them closer together or arch them or do something else with these, I, they're basic, they are objects. They are designs or going to be designed. So I would have to move them each individually to get them to um, do as I wanted. So if I wanted them arched, I would probably want to bring in a circle and rotate them and etc. Et I want to just leave them the way that they are. But just to let you know, if you wanted to say, make the W just larger on its own, select just the W, make him taller, make him smaller, however it is. Oh, I got the hawk is like zooming around right outside my window. And that's kind of low. <laughs> Sorry, I digress. We get nature coming in on the show. So these are, like I said, these are just objects. These are shapes. These are if you had drawn them by hand. This is how your true type fonts come in. So if I wanted to make these all to be cross stitch and have them all be the same, the I select the entire design, which is made up of all those objects. And I'm going to just go click on my little button here that says cross stitch and select them and they all become cross stitch. Now in the cross stitch dialog box, this is where you set how many crosses, stitches per inch. 10 is the kind of cross stitch you do when you are, um, they're kind of large. If you've ever seen a chart, that's 10 X's per inch. It's not huge, but most cross stitchers are doing 14, eight or 18 count by hand. The expert cross stitchers are doing something higher, like 22 or 28. However, our embroidery machines can't stitch crosses that small. Um, even if you use 100 weight thread and a 60 weight needle, 
doing 22 or 28 crosses per inch, that is wicked tiny, tiny, tiny. And uh, you're really perforating the fabric. So I don't recommend changing that cross size. But that's the cross size is number of stitches per inch. And you can go up to 18 is probably the highest that I would do. And again, I would probably use either 60 weight weight thread if you wanted to get a fine definition actually see the crosses if you use 40 weight thread it will be more um i want to say pixelated meaning that you'll see crosses if you look at it closely but you won't have any space they'd be rather tight they'd be almost like blocks of um of uh what do you call it blocks of color run right next to each other. So the highest number I would use, closest number to make the smallest X's are, is 18. Normally, and that's, that's a, a, a mighty small one. Does it matter if you choose, say, a number like 17 or 16 just to make it look better on the screen? No. Um, any number works. Just know that any true cross stitcher knows there's no such thing as 17 stitches per inch. There's no eight of cloth that is set up that way or linen. They're all even numbers. So if you're trying to get a look of true cross stitch, go with an even number like 14 or 18 or 10. Those are the standard cross stitch sizes. If you don't care and most of us just are going for the style, you can use any number you want. Now, if you notice, if you chose, choose a smaller number, or I should say smaller number because the X's are bigger. So let's go down to 10. Yep, 10. Sometimes the letters are not even as much. So like, if you notice, actually these are all, rather, oh, the M. See how this, this one is skinny, this one's fat, and this one's skinny on the side? If you want to make them all two rows, you have to actually go into the individual letter and reshape it because this is simple math here. So, and this guy, you'd actually want to carefully move this over so that you'll get the two rows going down and two rows going across and move them manually, which means your actual shape. So if you, you let's see, let's, when I mean actual shape, I'm turning, go back to artwork. This may not look like the original artwork, but when you assign the stitches to it, it looks more like what you're expecting it to look like. If that kind of makes sense. The stitches are what's important to the shape of the object. Doesn't make a difference because in machine embroidery, you want it to look right at the embroidery machine. Hopefully that's kind of, kind of making sense guys. So hopefully this went through this information on the dialogue box. I haven't seen any questions come up on the cross stitch area. I will let you know that um, the count, this is the number of threads that are going back and forth. So number of passes. So if you're looking for a thicker cross stitch and you have a like 10 point, uh, 10 count or 14 count, you might want to do a double cross. So that's like when you're using um, multiple strands of thread through your needle to get a thicker look. Otherwise, if you're doing 18 count, a double or single is what you're going to want. 10, 14, you could probably get away with this double or triple. 10, definitely a triple. You can get away with that. Now give a nice heavy look, almost like you're using um, a, a thicker because you're making three passes over each X. So, okay. Kim says she's picking it up so far. Excellent. Um, like I said, the hardest part with doing cross stitch is reshaping the letters to make them look even because when you're, you want them two rows, two rows, you don't want one, one, one donk, dorky thing sticking out here. Okay. So there's no more questions on the cross stitch. And hopefully that's not going to bother anyone that I didn't finish the M because we're going to go back and look at, do the next one. So I'm going to go back to my true type font here and the two which is just the word two. I'm just gonna pick a different font here so you can see how we can really morph these. So where it says your text here, let's see, Font Leroy. That's a nice, pretty, a lot of people like to play with this font. This ha is great for sketch. Font Leroy or Fog Lighter. You see how it has those um, a slightly swirly things on it. For cross stitch, this would, unless you're doing something really large, 
you're going to, you want to kind of go as simple as possible when you're doing uh, cross stitch, but for doing say a sketch, let's do and change your text here just to the word two. Um, well, let's, let's do, well, uh, yeah, we'll just leave it that way. I'm going to click it. Okay. here. This gives us our font. That's going to be here because we're going to do this one in sketch style. Now, just because you bring it in a certain shape doesn't mean you need to keep it that way. Because if you know, a sketch kind of needs to be a little bit larger. And I wanted it to be a little bit more pronounced. I was trying to make it look a little more stylized. So reshaping the objects, unless you're looking for something to match like in a logo exactly, you can reshape them, these objects, any, any size, shape you want. I mean, we wanted these T's, a little bit, the T to be a little bit wider. I'm going to just grab both of these little nodes here, drag them down. Whoops, I didn't grab them both. Missed one. Grab them both, drag it down, and I can make that just a little bit fatter that's in here. And I would want to obviously do that to both sides. Make it a little larger. So why this is important. Say you're working on a logo and the Arial font or Helvetica works perfectly well, but it's not wide enough or it's not, it's too skinny, too fat, not tall enough, or just been morphed a little bit, as opposed to redrawing the entire font or entire letter itself, you can bring in something to start with and then customize it and change it up because you're the artist here. You can do whatever it is that you want. Now, sketch designs, there, um, let me, first of all, let me change welcome to a different color just because then I know that it was done. Click on my little color chip and we'll make it green. Oops, not brown, green. Oh, Kim didn't know that you could grab two nodes. Yes, it's not easy to grab two nodes. Once you have your nodes highlighted, make sure you zoom in. So you wanna see nodes and you select more than one. Use your lasso. Select more than one, and now you can move just those two. Now that also works. Okay, glad you made that comment, Kim, because if you say you wanted this whole little guy here, this this thing, this end, this whole thing from this point forward, and you wanted to move this part over, first of all, you highlight your, let's start from the beginning. Highlight it so you see all the nodes. Your mouse in Stitch Artist, when you have nodes, pointing and those are those little dots, your mouse is a lasso. So left click and hold and drag your mouse around the nodes you want to select, release your mouse button and you'll see they all turn different color. They all turn blue. Now, when you put your mouse cursor on any one of them and you drag it, you're dragging all of those. So if you wanted this to be further out, you can do that. And then let's see, you want to delete some of these nodes? Select multiples of them, whoopsie. Hit the delete key, reshape, you know, so that's easier to, whoopsie, I didn't, I didn't mean to grab the note, I meant to grab the handle. Oh, let's just delete that guy, he's being pain in the butt. Move him down. Sing to the computer, it behaves so much better when you do that. But see how you can, you can reshape things really easily by selecting the object so that you see the nodes, Using your lasso to left click and hold and drag to grab multiple nodes. They all change color to a dark blue so that when you move things, you're moving all those three at one time. Now, if you just want to move that one bar up, looking at it, see how this one selected? I'd want to click off of it, click on it, and reselect just these top two because if you have more nodes selected, weird things happen. Okay, so... Oh, good. Glad you guys picked up a, a little tip here. Uh, Michelle's mind's blown. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> uh, we love giving nice tips and tricks and teaching you one more thing, even to the experienced users on how to do something in the software. And that was on basically editing stuff and has nothing to do really well. It does have things to do with um, true type fonts, but it's just um, something that extra you're going to use in, in something else that you're doing in the software. So let's change this to, to a sketch fill. So I want both letters to be the same. I'm going to so I select the whole design, 
clicked on the, the picture, the word two T O and I'm going to go up to my little fill stitch here. That fills it in with a, a stitch automatically. Now to do sketch, you click on your fill stitch tab and I want them all to have the same exact setting. So to have them all done at the same time, just click on fill and that's going to change them both the properties at the same time. My density, you have a, the density default is four. That's fabulous for fill if that's what you're looking for as far as the fill stitch goes. The slider that's to the right of it here, that only goes up to 15. Okay, that's the maximum that it will go. If you want a higher number, which means a higher the number, the further the rows of stitches are apart. So 15 points is 1.5 millimeters. It's not that far apart. Okay, think of one millimeter. That's it's far apart. It's gonna not be filled, but you wanna if you're looking for a real white space in between there, you might want 20, 22, 26, depending on the size of what it is that you want to do. So if you want to go beyond 15, type in the number you want, like 22, and hit the enter key on your keyboard, and that changes the density to you. Okay, so the slider only goes to 15, but you can type in any number you want. So once I have my um, density set to 22, which is a higher number, I can, that's the, st the stitches that are going this way. And we see the stitches going this way. Those are the underlay stitches. And in a sketch design, unless you're going for that style of crosshatch, which <laughs> you never know. What, do you, what if you are looking for crosshatch and you want it to actually kind of look like plaid and have the background fabric? That's not, that's actually not bad. And if you choose cat travel edge, boom, you kind of have that it looks like a, a pattern going through the background. And then you'd want to move your starts and stops, which I'll show you in a second. But because we are, let me uncheck this because I'm going to explain that in a second. Because we want to do a sketch, I just want it to be a sketchy fill. I'm going to go to the underlay and I'm going to click on turning everything off so that we have no underlay top or bottom. Um, Kim says she didn't realize that you can go go higher on the fill. And absolutely, you can type in any number you want. Just make sure you understand that the, the distance between the rows of stitches is, that's the, the number. So you don't really want to do four because that means it's going to do one row of stitches and jump a four millimeter jump because it's not going to stitch down four millimeters, it's going to jump four millimeters and then stitch back and cross. So doing anything above 30, 30 is, you're going to do a test so, and then you know if it works or not. <laughs> That's the best way to do something. Um, a cell. Uh, Sandy says, can you, you not use the motif fill to do the same thing or is there a difference? Well, motifs, okay, if you choose a motif fill, and you leave it at the default, uh, that's just ugly stitches. That's, you wanna use the fill stitch. You can use a motif itself, but not, um, you know, there's no, if you if you do the test so, and it works for the size that you've done and the shape that you've done, that's fabulous. But I'm just showing you how you would do a sketch with regular fill stitches here. So, set your distance, turn off your underlay, and you can sort of see, I'm going to go back to my fill. So the, this is the underlay button where I turn it off. And this is the fill properties. This option here says travel edge. This, do you see, can you see this? There's the, my edge of my object that is drawn. And do you see how the stitch one row is inset from the next row? That is so you don't get a bump on the edges and you don't perforate things because it would give a lot of distortion if you had every single needle point at 0.4 millimeters hitting that edge. It would, it would um, if you were stitching on something with no stabilizer underneath it and say using a sharp needle, you'd pretty much perforate it and it would fall right through and you'd end up with a mess. So the when you're doing a regular fill stitch, you don't want it to travel to the edge. But when you're doing a sketch, by choosing travel edge, that means every row of stitch is automatically going to go to the edge. And anything that travels is also going to go to the other edge. Now, when I say travels, do you see that line center in the middle? Let me click on just the letter T. 
That happens, and if you are in the Stitch Artist Digitizing Fans group, you watch the snowman videos, that's because our little um, start and stop is set here to the bottom. It's going to start at the bottom, and it's going to stop at the bottom. Well, the only way to fill this shape is by... It, with this as the start and stop is by having it travel somehow. It can't just start start here and do a nice clean fill to get to the top and then come all the way back to the bottom without repeating itself somehow. So if you move your start and stops to different locations, like I'll put the start at the at well, let's see. I'm gonna keep the stop at the bottom here. Boom, move that one here and move the stop to the top right there. You can get rid of some of those travels. But you're going to always have, you have to have some of them simply because it has to get from point A to point B. If I probably, me, if I move this all the way to the bottom here and maybe move this one over to the side, there's some ways that you can move it, but complex shapes that look like this, there's no way of, of not having sort of a run. But you can minimize it. And if you choose travel edge, it makes it nice and even. Now, one thing you'll notice here is, can you see there's a, a line? Our T has a diagonal on the side of it. That's because this is a little, the row of stitching based upon the density that we chose. In order to get from this line of stitching to the next line of stitching, it can't, it's not going to start in the middle. It's not going to do that. So it has to it has to either go on this side or go on the other side and connect in like this. So your options for fixing this are either to change your density to a different number, or you can sometimes change your stitch length to different numbers, and that will um, adjust things. Or you can move your nodes so that they're in different locations, and that will also adjust where those are um coming in. A lot of times of what you can do here where it says 22, maybe type in 22.3 and it can maybe adjust them or maybe go down to 21 and you'll see that things are adjusting. And you play with that. You make so you make you make the objects, the art, the design look the way you want it to look like. So I think if I change this one to maybe 20, what the da da Play around with your numbers until you get what it is that you're going for, okay? Now, you can also, in this sketch, we have it set to zero to fill top to bottom. If you change your angle of the stitches, that will create a different look effect. See how, how fun that looks? It almost looks like a barber pole type, type style. So one thing to keep in mind while you are, are working on this um, settings is we now want to make sure that this one kind of does the same thing. So I have this one set to 20. This one needs to get set to 20 because I did do them separately. I need to set this to travel edge. I'm going to set one of these, whoopsie, grab the wrong thing. Command Z undo. Grab my bow tie, move one to one side, move this guy to the other side so that it feels nice and neat. My mouse is a little jumpy. And you get our two, our two letters. Now, Kim says the O reminds her of an olive. It kind of does look like a green olive. You need a little pimento in the center. That'd be kind of cute. With sketch designs, you're normally, when you're going with a solid straight fill for this. So you're not going for a watercolor look where you're doing blending and feathering and things like that. A nice way to finish these off is to put a, a running stitch outline around them. And then you'll basically have your run on both sides because this is not what you normally see with a sketch. You don't have that open area. So one of the things that you can do is select your letter. We're going to go up here to where it says copy. I'm going to right click on this and say paste over it so that it puts the copy right after it. And I'm going to change this to be a running stitch and set it to be a double run or a bean stitch, whatever it is that I want. And now it has a nice finished, finished look. And it's going to stitch out that T at one time. So when you're, let's see, and it's going to finish, it starts and it finishes. And then, whoops, this run, I'd want to make sure that the start of this run is at the bottom so that there's no jumpy thing. And 
that just leaves a problem. Lori says, I make this look and sound so easy, but you're so confused. <laughs> Sorry, I, I type fast and I've already gone through, I talk fast. I try not to make it confused, but the beauty of a live video on Facebook is that it's saved and you can watch it again and hit the rewind button and pause and rewind and, and come back and see what it is that you want to see it. Seriously, as soon as you start playing in the software and pushing buttons, that's when things start to click. Watching someone do a, a live video or a, any of the videos, even the ones that are on the YouTube channel, watching them start to finish and thinking that you're going to pick up every single bit of information and just go to your software and 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 wish it was um, um, implanted. Yeah, sorry, that doesn't happen. I was hoping for that today, but I, I like I said, I took a class this morning and I had to rewatch a few of the videos four or five times because I missed points. I, I didn't understand what he was talking about. I had to watch it again. So it happens to everybody. If you're not, until you're comfortable with what you're doing, it's okay to watch rewind. No one knows. No one realizes. Susan says, copy and paste on top is a great technique. This is very new. Um, yes, it's a, one of those time-saving features that's in the program. So I'm going to show that one more time because we're going to do it with the O. So I'm going to select the O. I'm going to go to copy and I'm going to right click on it and I'm going to say paste over and that pastes a copy right on top of where this one is. It's not that big of a deal for when it's the last one when you're doing the copy paste over, but like say you wanted to go back up to that cross stitch and you wanted to add outlines to those for, you know, why not? Because you can. <laughs> You'd want to do each individual letter and copy paste over, copy, paste over, and change them all to outlines. Um, Kim asks, so the paste under would just move the T before the thing you copied. Absolutely. So let me do that. Let me hit the delete here. So I'm going to select this O and I'm going to right click on it because it's still copied to my clipboard. And if I say paste under, it actually puts it right in the, in the, in the top here. So I, and then it, it paste over, takes the object and pastes it so it's on top. Paste under means it moves it forward and paste replace means say you, um, oh, okay. Where's my O in here? Here's my O, boom. Say I wanted to replace this O with the other O here. All I have to do is right click on this one and say paste replace and it replaces it right with the other one. So that's really, really handy if you're fixing something that exists a few times, like say in a wreath or letters. I mean, say if you had something that was like St. Stanislaus and you had to um, re you fix the S. Well, now you have St. Stanislaus and you only have to, you can just do a copy paste replace a few times. That's super cool. Of course, that now that doesn't match our our design, but that's okay. It, I showed you a new something new that maybe some of you didn't know. Now, this one, just before I for, don't forget, this guy here, do I have my O? Yes, I need to select this one and change this one to a running stitch and um, we'll just make it into a bean stitch just so that it's nice and easy. And we have our fill with our nice little bean stitch. Now, here's another trick. You see my T has an angle going across it and our O is still going straight across. And I want it to be the exact same as the T, okay? Because I want them all to be, I found one, I really like that angle, and I really want this one to be that same angle. Okay, so I gotta click on the T to make sure I have the fill selected because running stitches don't have angles, okay? I put my mouse cursor on the yellow angle changer and I left click and hold and I just move it a, a, little, a little bit. Okay, so I can see it. On the bottom taskbar, I can't let go of my mouse because if I let go, it's going to disappear the angle, I think. No, it keeps the angle. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I didn't realize it was going to do that. See, oh, but as soon as I move my mouse, it hides it. Okay, but I'm looking right here. See at the bottom of the screen where my, where my hoop size is? If I put my mouse cursor on my angle and I move it a little bit, do you see the angle that shows up? So I have it set right now to uh, 21 degrees. See that 21? That means if I select this fill here and I move this angle up, I can wait till that says 21 degrees. Go slow, not too fast. One more, boom. 
Now they're both exactly the same. Okay, so I have two angles that are exactly the same. Um, zero, if I wanted to go the exact opposite in the other direction, all I have to do is subtract um, 180 from minus 21 degrees. So that'd be 159, I think, possibly. <laughs> uh, no, 169. Yeah, 169. And that would give me the angle going in the other direction so that you can have them opposites of each other. So that's kind of cool. Changing the angles, sketch fills. Now in level one, your sketch fill here, you have, you can just do one single um, um, yeah, distance. So I have it set to 20. The whole thing is two millimeters apart from the whole thing. In level two, when you have, so this is my level two and level three, of course, you have an option here, a new button that, oh no, I have to click off of it and click on it again. Boom. You have two new buttons here. You have, you can curve it. So if you wanted to do these to be curved um, gradients, but you also have the option of doing the gradients for um, increasing, decreasing, open ends, open middle. What this means is say we want it to be bottom heavy. So that means I can set it to be increasing and set it to be, a, it means it's heavy on the top, lighter on the bottom and vice versa. So those, the gradients are all in level two and higher, but in level one, you can do sketch fills with a single um, distance from each other. So, um, uh, Mary was saying she was playing with the angles this weekend and wondering how to get them to be the same. So glad I could show you a, another neat tip there. And um, wow, Michelle, another new thing. <laughs> So I'm blowing Michelle's mind here. And Susan says, more than two new techniques. Yes. Uh, uh, Michelle says, like shading. Absolutely. These sketch fills are fabulous for doing a shading on top of an object and doing a gradient sketch fill. That's how you can make something look, um, make a one big solid color and then layer another color underneath and have the bottom and top show through. That's all copy, paste under, paste over, layering your things. Oh, lots of new things that can happen here. Okay. So, do I even need to show you applique? <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. I, I figure I'll get a riot standing if I only showed part of it. <laughs> Look at our lovely design. All right. So we're going to go back to, let me go back to level one here. Click level three, level one. Back to our true type font. Now this one, when you're wanting to do applique, skinny swirly fonts, unless you have a Mongo hoop and you're going to make something really big, uh, skinny fonts. No, that's you. First of all, even if you're cutting with a, with a silhouette or a brother scan and cut, you don't want to cut real skinny fabric. It's get distorted. It just, no, not, not my idea of a good idea. <laughs> Sue says, yes, applique. So when you're looking for, um, applique fonts or fonts that you want to do something in applique, you want to find something that is a chunky. I think Gil is, is one of them. Nope. That isn't one of them. But, oh, Geekabyte. This is the one I found. That was a kind of a fun, funky um, applique type type font. Do you see how it, when you look at the preview, it, it's chunky, it's fat, it's got some meat to it. These are great. The fat ones are also good for motif fills. So when you're doing decorative stitches like dots and squiggles and um, crosses and little flowers and hearts and stuff, you want a chunky font. So this one I happened to find it was kind of funky looking and I'm going to type in, what did I have it um, set here? Maybe fonts was just the word I typed in, F-O-N-T-S, all capitals. So I think that's all that shows up in the font. Click OK and I need to move it down. One thing about moving things while you're in Stitch Artist, when you put your mouse cursor on the um, green dot in the center, do you see how your cursor turns into a hand? That means you can move whatever's under the hand. If you happen to move your mouse cursor off of the center dot, you can't move the entire shape. Okay, that's just a tip. So moving in Stitch Artist, whatever's selected, you have to have the hand and that lets you move it around. Okay, so applique, that obviously needs to be larger. So I click on my shift key and I drag it big because nobody wants to um, make small, tiny applique fonts. If you do, well, that's not, I'm just gonna move this over the side so we're, it's not underneath the two. 
Okay, sometimes what I, I wanted to make this big enough so that it was obvious. Oops. Ooh, 45 minutes I've been yapping away. Okay. <clears throat> sometimes your true type fonts come in and when you enlarge them or the spacing of them, they start to overlap like this T and this S. So you sometimes you may need to move them over the sides and when I saw this font, I was like, you know, this is really an, an odd, odd, funky font. It was nice and chunky, but it just, it didn't work for me as far as um, the sizing goes. I didn't want some letters smaller than the other letters. So you do, I didn't feel like I needed to resize them. This is also when you're moving things around like this and you're, you're uh, looking at them and trying to figure out your plan because every embroidery digitizing project needs to have a plan. Um, I was thinking, wow, I want this to be applique and I want the essence of this font. I don't want it to be overlapping each other. I want it to be separate of each other. I really don't want to trim those little doohickey guys, but I kind of like the shape. This is when selecting it and selecting your nodes and hitting the delete key to reshape these makes things a little easier because sometimes like this T, I mean, really all those little nodes in there, you know, it'd be, it doesn't need to have that. That little curve is not necessary, but that was just how the font was drawn. So as a, um, it works for flood fill. It just doesn't work when you're doing, uh, oh my, I didn't need that tiny curve. So you can reshape these. We've already kind of gone to that before. Now applique. Now that I have my font set up the way or my letters set up the way I want to, I'm just going to change these all to be applique and I can go to my applique tab. And one thing that you kind of want to um, play with here, you have your border stitches that you can choose. If you're doing, um, uh, you have different choices that you can choose from the E stitch, the blanket stitch, the satin stitch, which is our typical, um, machine embroidery. If you wanted to do a zigzag, zigzags are nice when you're trying to do something fast. And it's also gives it kind of like a, um, vintage look. That's why I was sort of liking it, liking that on it. Um, because it's, they call it in some, when you're doing like the Greek letters and they're large Greek letters. And you'll notice that this, there's a lot of times when you purchase a sorority shirt or, um, a fraternity shirt, the Greek letters are put on or baseball shirts, anything, uh, with a tackle twill. That is the type of style. It's a open zigzag. It's not a full satin. So the stitch is really nice. It's usually done in the same color thread as the fabric that you're stitching it with. A couple of the, the tricks I wanted to show you with your fonts is that you can, first of all, make sure you know that you can choose your, um, fabric preview that shows you what the little fabric pieces are going to look like so that you can actually see, um, background. Katrina asks, is reconstructing the outline the same as removing extra nodes? Uh, yes, it is. However, it doesn't always work, um, on true type fonts simply because the way that they're auto digitized, try it. But yes, on level three under the create menu under outlines, there's an option that says reconstruct outlines. Sometimes I can simplify and get rid of some of those extra nodes. But when you're looking to say reshape something to make a smoother edge, it's easier to select and delete, but, um, uh, find the tool that works best for you. Hopefully that works. Kim says like on the old letter jackets. Yes. On letterman jackets, um, sports jackets, you, the satin that's on the back of them. It's not really a satin. Um, we kind of invented that satin stitch <laughs> on applique when, then when the home embroidery machines came out because it does a finishing edge. No one did that by hand with any sewing machine. Um, it was more, more this way. And, and, uh, the big jackets, they got, they stitch faster. That's just the, and usually when you're doing, um, multiples like fraternities, baseball, letterman jackets, you're not just doing one and it's not for your grandchild. It's you're doing a set of 12 or 15 or however many that the team needs booster club. So time is money getting that time in there. Um, so showing the fabric applique behind his is done with the fabric preview. If you are using a cutting machine, whoops, have to have my stitches here. 
um, a cutting machine, like a silhouette or a brother's scan and cut or a Cricut. You need to have a position stitch, but you don't necessarily need to have the material stitch. Material stitch is what holds down. So that's a second running stitch. If you're trimming by hand, you need the first one to hold the fabric in place or, or to show you where the fabric goes. The second run, which is the material, will, and you would want to check this, that tacks it down in place so you can remove your hoop and manually trim all your fabric. But if you are doing pre-cuts, like with a cutting machine, you don't have to have that turned on. You can do it, whatever it is. Now, the color of the fabric. See how I have this shown here? This is set by the color of your applique position. So if you click on this color chip and choose a different color, let's go up here and choose, oh, pink, why not? Do you see how your fabric changes in the background here? So that you can actually see what the preview is. So when you have a letter selected, it will have X, as however many colors that it needs. So this is the position stitch and this is our finishing stitch. So if you want the finishing stitches to be um, just showing in a different color, you can click on that. But the color of your fabric is set by the, the, the position stitch. So if you wanted to say change every other one to a different color, click on this. Click on your color chip. I'm going to go to palettes. Click on my little um, color chip here. And uh, I can change my colors that way. And go for that and changing that. Uh, so there you have it. <laughs> This, these are just some of the fun things that you can do with your true type fonts. And I was using Stitch Artist Level 1, everything that's done here except for the gradients that I had shown. And of course, when I talked about the uh, reconstructing outline of Level 3, everything I showed could be done in Stitch Artist Level 1. And it's, this is, this is a lot easier, a lot more fun, a lot more creative than trying to do, um, Satin, which is what we traditionally get with uh, satin fonts. It's traditionally what we get when we get BX fonts. We have their satin columns and they are um, the normal stuff. So what I showed you is how to do things that are not so normal, like cross stitch, or you can put a motif fill or sketch fills. Create from, from any of your fonts. Very simple, easy to do. Um, easy way to customize them, create some new fun designs. Um, hopefully, uh, let's see, Frida asked, can I, um, oh, you want to know what the pre-cut button does. So on the applique, when you have, when you check the pre-cut button, that means it's like, say you have a Sizzix, you know, the hand cutter, or you are, um, you've purchased laser cut shapes. So you sent them out of a specific size and you want your digitizing to match that specific size. That's where the pre-cut comes in. So this is like from a die cutter. Uh, say you, you purchased a studio die for an Accu quilt and you digitize that shape and you don't want to accidentally reshape it because it needs to match that pre-cut size. So when you choose the pre-cut option, that means you can't change the size. It's, it locks it to be that size, which it's nice because then it, it fits that die, that cut file, that pre-cut shape. That's all pre-cut does on the applique button does. Um, Michelle says she thinks she's a scan and cut. She's going to ask Santa for one. Absolutely. Santa needs to bring you a new toy. <laughs> oh, so, uh, uh, people ask what's if, uh, um, a scan and cut, a silhouette saves you a lot of time. I I find it does. I have both. I like my scan and cut. I've, they both work pretty much the same. But um, I like my scan and cut for fussy cutting because it has a scanner built in. And you, I put my fabric on my mat, scan it in, move my shape, and cut exactly on it. So for fussy cutting, fabulous. And I have one of the old, old ones. So I don't have Bluetooth or any of those fancy fancy features, but mine cuts cork and felt and all sorts of stuff. Um, and it works perfectly fine. <laughs> uh, the silhouette is, um, uh, silhouette, it cuts the same way, except you, it works like a printer. So you have to open the software, 
at least I have the older one. So I open the software and I bring in my cut files and I cut it out on fabric. Nancy asked, what stitch artist is this? I was doing this in stitch artist one. So you can do it in any of the levels of stitch artists, except for the um, extra things that I mentioned, such as gradients or reconstruct outline. I mentioned what those features were in, but all the basic stuff I did was in stitch artist level one. Uh, uh, Joe's going to show her sister what she learned tonight. What a fabulous idea. Share the knowledge. I mean, first of all, she's going to love you for it. Okay. That's just going to be, you're going to be her hero. But second of all, it's going to reinforce it in your head so that you're going to be showing her. And even though you may have to watch the video again and show her again, it, you're going to remember it. Perfect. That, that's, that's awesome. 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 Sandy says she, oh, uh, that was great. She learned something watching these. Excellent. Uh, glad you uh, found it um, informative, Jesse. Uh, you have to save applique in a separate file for the scan and cut. You just save it on, on the just like in quick tip video number five, no, number six, saving your cut file, save it as FCM right to the machine. So hopefully, um, um, Joe asks, how do I treat my fabric before I cut? Well, I have a complete blog post that talks about it. Um, anything that goes into a cutter, the cutters were designed for non-movable fabrics, non-movable items like paper. Can't stretch paper, can't stretch vinyl, well, you can stretch vinyl, but uh, think of paper, okay? You can't stretch it, it's got, so whatever you put under that blade should be as paper-like as possible. That's probably the best advice I can give. So starch the bejeebies out of it. I always uh, use a, a fusible backing on mine simply because I don't put a tack down, I don't put a, yeah, tack down stitch. I only do a placement so I know exactly where the cut piece goes and I press into place. I use a product by ThermoWeb called Heat and Bond Stretch. If you go to my um, my website, and let me type this in on the comment. I forgot to open this in here. But let's see, www.so-bubbles.com. There you go, slash FB Live. Okay, the link that I just put in the comments here, that has links to the Amazon products that I use. It also, of course, if anyone wants to get the Stitch Artist software or, or any of the other Stitch Art uh, in Brilliance programs, my affiliate link is there. Um, information on the scissors I use. All, all of my information I talk about in the various blog posts or Facebook Lives I put on this. So if you are looking for that, I use Heat and Bond Stretch and it was designed so that you can actually fuse it to a knit fabric that you can cut out as your applique and take that applique and fuse it to a knit fabric and follow the instructions. When you stretch that knit, the knit applique stretches with it. Love the product because then when you put it, because it's fused and that applique, um, the fusible stuff actually stretches, all of my appliques don't pop. They just stay fused to my t-shirt. So love the product. And so if you forget, you want more information, that link is on that Facebook live page. So, <sighs> I'm done. <laughs> I survived and I got to use some of the shortcuts I learned in my class today. I hope all of you learned some of the shortcuts to learn in this class today or this little Facebook live. Oh, I didn't even get this. I was talking so much. I didn't even get to sip my beer tonight, but I will go and enjoy it. My family's out watching the movie. So I hope you guys have a great evening and I will see you next week. Just to let you know, before I forget, I will see, I know a couple of you I'm going to see in Deco Summit. I think, it's, is that next week? Oh my goodness. We're coming into October. I can't believe it's October. Um, um, uh, Deco Summit's coming up. And then after that, I am in Australia. I've got the two-day event in Brisbane and I'm on vacation with my hubby. We're going to have a grand old time. And I'm one of my most favorite countries to visit. I know there's only a few spots left in the Brisbane. So if anyone's in Australia and you're hoping to get in, make sure you check in with Gary Walker or the folks at Echidna Sewing Products so that they can get you booked in. And after that, I will hopefully have my schedule set set for next year. I'm looking at Houston, Nashville, and um, Atlanta are the first three that I have scheduled along with the Everything Embroidery Market and Applique Getaway because those two are already set in. So, yes, Michelle, you need to read my blog more. Lots of posts that are on there. My website does have a search for the blog. So if you go onto the website on the desktop, it's right at the, the 
the side that's over here. What's that? The right hand side it says search blog. You can type in stuff like applique or enthusiast or dense repair kit, whatever it is. And it searches the whole blog for all that information. All right, guys. <sighs> I've talked. <laughs> I've run over my hour. So I look forward to seeing you next week. And yes, you can rewatch this. They're always recorded. And um, every Monday, you can scroll back and watch all the previous ones. Take care, guys. Bye.